The day is finally here, and history will be made. Taking it to the next level, live from Denver, Colorado. Cryptos Media proudly presents FE 2018 USA, the second annual Flat Earth International Conference in America. Iru Landucci. So it's you know it's, it's like uh, being in the next year the NASA employers the NASA astronaut they must be maybe do the same thing <laughs> start running after the country so well I'm gonna try to start my my presentation after this because <laughs> it's a little difficult <laughs> okay um, well like Rick said I have a bunch of slides to show. Um, Maybe I didn't finish. I, I, I never finish my presentations. You know, I live open to see you again in the future. And it's like an infinite presentations uh, every time I make something. So I'm going to try to uh, get to the end this time. But I know that I'm never going to do it. So uh, <laughs> we're going to start for, no, for the people that doesn't know me. Um, I came from Argentina. And uh, this is my second time in the United States, so thank you guys for having me here. And um, this time, my, my, my presentation is going to be about, you know, some technical stuff, uh, but also more uh, historical uh, facts and, uh, sim you know, symbolics and occ occultist uh, things. Because for me, understanding the process uh, of the flat earth is, is not just, you know, s solving math or, or, or going to the technical stuff. Uh, it's more important understand when it started, who started, and why it started. And um, a lot of people that uh, re reject this topic is because they don't do their own research in, in the history because immediately you're gonna find it who is support this and it's the same elite in power that, uh, you know, uh, rule the world today. So it's, it's not uh, difficult to understand who is behind the, the scenes. So I'm gonna make this kind of, uh, you know, mix situations and that is for David. Start drinking, man. And um, I'm prepared because I'm gonna say it a, a few times. And um, um, like I tell you before, I come from Argentina. I have 37 years old. My job is technical director on visual effects. So I come into the flat earth and the moon landing hoax because my profession allowed me to understand what is going on uh, with that videos. In fact, I do that kind of visual effects. And um, I have been 13 years uh, from now researching about the new world order and trying to understand what is happening in the world. Uh, as a researcher from four years, and uh, I have my own radio shows in Argentina uh, from the four years from now. And I also study and really recommend uh, the shamanic medicine. Uh, that is really important to, to understand what happened when you have some, you know, kind of thoughts and feelings and how you affect that directly to the, to the body. And uh, it's really important to, you know, to understand why we are here, but, uh, you know, also uh, what affects us in, uh, in terms of our feelings. Um, so, I'm going to start it. I don't want to lose more time. The first, the first things, uh, you know, I'm going to be, go a little quickly uh, with this, but the first of all is we all been um, teaching in, sc in school uh, about the shape of the earth. Uh, you know, we, 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 the, the only place where you go to get that education is in educational institutions. And 
there is only one, at least for the occidental part of the world, who put all together and give it. It doesn't matter if, it, if it's in the United States and Argentina, in, in every occidental part of the world, it's only one institution that give the educational program to the teachers and the children, and that is the UNESCO. And how you can read here uh, is not only a cultural education, it's also a scientific education. Because this is go beyond elementary school or high school, this is go to universities and also, you know, masterings. So that is why maybe it's not so hard to uh, give one uh, way to the to the, the world, you know, in terms of education. So the founders of this institution, um, or the founder, not the founder, but the first director, and I believe also he participated in the foundations, was Julian Huxley from the Huxley family, which is a guy that uh, support the, he was an, an eugenicist, and of course he supports the work of Darwin, Charles Darwin, but he also has, you know, a brother at that time. And the brother was uh, the guy who write, you know, a happy world, the doors of perceptions, the script of the Alice in Wonderland. And he was an occultist, an, an, an occultist guy uh, with a lot of mysticism, like you can read directly from Wikipedia. So you can imagine the family, you know, in a normal dinner, you know, changing ideas, so what, what are you gonna teach us in, in the school and the way, so you can start see, you know, the, 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 the roots of the UNESCO. And regarding to the, to the shape of the earth, uh, this was presented by Robert Bassano, uh, who is a really great guy researching in flat earth. And this is, and, and in my country, for example, we have the same thing, but here you can see, you know, periodically, they, they, they made this kind of um, statistics, uh, you know, pick up children's, group of children's, in this case, from Greece and from the United States, and, you know, start asking questions about, uh, for them, how is the shape of the earth, what happened with the day and night cycles, uh, if this really something like a pull they attract the things to the center of the sphere. And of course, the, the natural response of the, of the, of the child is like, uh, like, you, like uh, you can read here. They, they, they don't agree with that. You know, the, the common sense and the natural feeling of a child is like uh, the earth is flat, the day and night cycle is because the moon and the sun moving around the earth. There is no center that pulling all the things um, to that center is it's just uh, uh, common sense, nothing like that, uh, nothing more than that. So when you read, for example, both the Greeks and the American children conceptualize that the earth is uh, as flat and stationary, and uh, it was located in the middle of the solar system. That is the first perception. So they create these institutional programs to change that. Of course, the, the best, uh, you know, uh, when you are a child, you cannot even discuss or understand what is going on. So they, they break, uh, brainwash very quickly. But when you, when you go to the university, they do the same thing. For example, this is a, you know, a paper from my university in psychology, and immediately you can, uh, you, you can see the tendency. You know? uh, they teach you the heliocentric theory, the evolution of the species, and the um, discovery of the unconsciousness. So it's ev in every step of the life, the brainwash continue because they need to create this kind of propaganda behavior when, you know, repeat and repeat and repeat, doesn't matter the age, doesn't matter the culture, the country, the idea must be there that the earth is a sphere rotating around the sun because that is the only way they, they, they can control the world. So when you start looking into the real professions uh, to study, there is only one uh, in that list that you cannot study. 
And of course, that is the astronaut profession. You just, uh, the, you know, for being a Pope, for being a 33 Freemason degree, or for being an astronaut, it's just only by selecting with a finger. It doesn't matter what your skills are. It's just, um, yeah, is that uh, how it works, you know? It's some place of privilege. And we, as a people, we don't have any um, chance to select. We don't vote for the Pope. We don't vote for an astronaut. We don't vote for, for no one, uh, even for the director of the ONU, of the UNESCO. So they create this illusion that we live in a free world, you know, when, where we have um, the opportunities to select things, but we don't. We just select puppets like uh, politicians and nothing more than that. So when you go to, I, I, I'm going to make it this a, a little faster because I want to get to the point of my presentation. But for me, this is, uh, this is important to understand. When, you know, when you're trying to understand who was the, um, the scholars who, who had the information really in the past, you, you, you want to realize that the first guys that have access to real um, information, to real education, was only the religious people. Because the rest of the people, they don't even know how to read or write. They don't have access to book. In the past, you are not going to a library and buy a book or that kind of things. Uh, the people just work for the king or for the authorities at that time. So the information always was, you know, um, kept by these religious people. Then they start to, you know, share a tiny bit with the first, if you want to call um, agents, from for them, which was uh, you know creating this kind of hierarchies when you start seeing the the alchemist, the Kabbalah, and that kind that that kind of um, um, that that kind of hierarchies. You know, the religious people instruct and give some knowledge to this guy, so this guy keep um, dividing the information. You know and uh, present to the rest of the, of the world. But until 1950, 1930, at least in my country, uh, the majority of the people, they don't have even access to the school. You, you always need to pay to have access to education. But that education, it doesn't matter how much you pay. Uh, it comes from the same sources. And it has been um, you know, divided and compartmentalized. <laughs> putting compart compartment con Richard that compartment <laughs> and um, just for you know for us never reach the top of the real information so remember that for example in terms of religious information the Vatican they never open the library we're still waiting to the most you know nice religion out there sharing the real information with the people. So when you start looking into who is behind the scenes, at least at the first sight, you're going to find always a Jesuit. Always. There is no, you know, you, you, cannot, you can escape <laughs> of these guys. <clears throat> so for example, at the time of uh, Leonardo da Vinci, it was this uh, Jesuit called Atanasiv Kirchner, who was the first one in proposed, of course, he was, you can read it directly from Wikipedia, he was a symbologist, secrecy, magic, Kabbalah, alchemy, and occultism. The mystery of the human knowledge for dealing for the mortals and transmitted from remote antiquity from the Egyptian. That is why we see all the plays pyramids, obelisk, and that kind of symbology that reminds Egyptian culture, but was, you know, put there, not by the Egyptians, but uh, for the church, in this case, for this order. And uh, 
For example, this guy was um, also one of the first that create what we know as today as you know movie projectors. But at that time was called the Magic Ladder. And you can see here on the bottom, of course, the picture that they're gonna show us is like a demon because uh, you know they base their knowledge based on fear because it's more easy to control us by fear, you know, by putting ideas that uh, doesn't have any sense but produce fear in your mind so they can control you. But when we see that, you know, um, kind of really close relation between Hollywood and the and NASA and uh, Hollywood being that the holy good, you know, created but it, all this organization is because they actually was the first uh, guys to create a movie project. So that is how deep the things go. And this guy also, for example, he present the, one of the first model that uh, the Earth was in a sphere and has a nucleus, uh, you know, burning with fire. And um, this is the depiction of, you know, this is the modern concept and this is the old concept. But the first one uh, was presented by this kind of uh, order. It's not by scientists. They are the scientists at that, at that time. So um, don't forget that the Vatican has the most big uh, library. And after, you know, after um, a couple of centuries, all that information was put together and they create, the Jesuit also create the Freemasonry. It's simply as that. They create this kind of, you know, they subdivide the things to control more easy. And uh, to the 70s and 18th centuries, where the Freemasonry really start to, to get uh, important into the society, the first one, the father of the Freemasonry, the modern Freemasonry, uh, was this guy called um, Elias Ashmole. He was considered the father of the Freemason, and he also worked with, with uh, astrologers, with al alchemists, with mathematicians, he found the Royal Society of London, the Philosophical Society of Oxford. So you can start see this concept, but the real knowledge of this guy uh, was Egyptian and Hermetic, you know, studies. So we back again to the Babylon, to Egyptian culture. And after this guy died, he, he write a, a lot of books, you know, trying to, uh, talking about the solar system of, of or the Earth system, uh, of course, they they kept you know the real information for the highest ranks in these societies, and for the rest of the fellowships, they 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 just give you know uh, not real information. Um, after he died, the guy who comes to um, you know to be the first keeper of the museum of Elias Ashmole was Robert Plot. And it's really, you know, interesting because this guy at that time in the early, um, you know, in the final 70th century, uh, he proposed the idea of the dinosaurs. It, not, it wasn't Charles Darwin or someone else in the 19th century. It was this guy. And this is the first depiction that he made, and this is like, you know, like a Velociraptor or, you know, that kind of um, class of dinosaur. And uh, he also proposed the first um, crop cycles. So the same guy at that time proposed the idea of the crop cycles and the dinosaurs. And uh, nobody teach this in school or universities. I, I don't believe that, you know, the, the the guys who study evolution know, know, uh, knows this. I never heard it. some, you know, scholar talking about Robert Plot. And uh, we know the relationship between the crop cycles and what is called that the blue bean or the fake alien invasion that Rob Skiba always uh, show, because this is a relation. That this is how, you know, deep the things go, because this is not just uh, 
100 year thing or 15 year thing this is not start on the moon landing or you know on the rocket uh of the um german rocket technology and from that point of the history start all this fake the uh, the space this is is really go in our history so for me the dinosaur is just like a, you know put the different green animals into the mixer and make this magic thing because when you really start looking to the dinosaurs you can clearly see like a reverse engineering of the real nature and uh, they only painting in green and you know and add some kind of <laughs> spikes to the column and you have the dinosaur and um without offense you know any professional in the field but it's really nobody uh, really found any real school of the dinosaur or real body entire body is just uh you know presented by freemasonry basically so the first universities and the our days uh, um, schools are created by jesuit in fact loyola was the founder of the jesuit order and uh you can see you know when for example you finish the studies in university when you dress like this, it's because they are dressing you like a Jesuit. And you don't even know that. It's like uh, you become a Jesuit. And uh, you can clearly see in the... Uh, and that, that's his idea, you know? They, they, they're all times playing games with us uh, and we don't have the knowledge to, to understand. They don't hide that kind of thing. We are the guys who don't understand what's going on behind the scenes. And that is, have a, is, is, is for a reason. It's because we don't receive really true, you know, freedom of education. And some people do. Some people really have a good education. And maybe one of the most, you know, out there um, free information to get for free uh, is the system of the trivium and quadrivium education, which comes from Greeks. So you must be looking, you know, uh, a little closer because we understand that the books that we receive today, uh, it's printed by the same guy that controls the world. So you must be really do, you know, comparison and trying to get many different sources and trying to compare and, you know, make your own education if you want to see in that way. And something that I'm, to me, really, um, you know, start putting the things into place about talking about freedom and slavery, it was the word family, for example, which is a word that we, we used to, you know, we use in our daily basis, you know, trying, you know, we think that refers to something good, but it's family, it's the group of the slaves, it's group of slaves, literally, you know, you, if you go and look, and do the same research, you're gonna find that because it's, it's, it's there in the dictionary. Anytime you refer my family, it's like saying my group of slaves because the real world is my bloodline. It's not the family. The family is the slave that worked for the Romans um, guys. And that is how, you know, they, they, you know, they, they play games on us. And for understand this kind of thing, you need to go to the roots of the language. And this, you know, is, is, is a difficult thing, but you need to do it. It's, uh, you know, it's not easy to uh, break this matrix. So when you start, you know, putting all this together, you're gonna stand, you, you, you're gonna start uh, to understand the importance of the symbols and numbers that uh, this guy use all the time, you know, for planning, uh, you know, like a um, fall flag or for planning events that they control and they want to give, uh, you know, some kind of message. They use Sematria. And, you know, the numbers in the letters, uh, we come from the Greeks. We come from that system of education, like trivium and quadrivium. They use it, they use it because it's, it's a really nice system to communicate, you know? And we as a normal people, we don't have that knowledge. So for, for us, it's just, you know, letters and, you know, random numbers, but uh, 
that is really far away from reality. Um, so when you start study this kind of thing, you immediately going to be aware that the the modern uh, guys uh, follow the Aleister Crowley um, schematia. You know, I mean, the guys in these elite powers that even in the space, we know that Chuck Parson, um, Vernon von Brown, you know, that kind of guys, uh, they are that, um, um, followers of Alertus Crowley teaching. So I hope you understand where I'm, you know, where I'm going with this. But the important thing is when you see a symbol or when you see a number, that is also, uh, you know, the, is energy, is frequency. Because the voice that when you pronounce letters or words, it's a vibration that I, you, I, I, can, I can really heal you with words or I can really make heart in you just with simple words. It doesn't matter if it's a physical contact. It's all based in, in, in energy. So for example, when we follow the teaching of Nikola Tesla and we repeat things like, uh, if you want to find the secret of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration, we used to just think in terms, you know, to understand the space or, 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 or the matter, matter here of the energy just in the lab. But uh, they use it that, you know, this, the lead power used in those fields, but they also use in these other fields, which is in the communication, in the social communication. So the idea behind all this introduction is, you know, trying to illustrate a little bit or mix a little bit the energy manifestations in terms of, you know, uh, real science, you know, the observable science, but also in terms of uh, perceptions energy, you know, um, sublime energies that affect us all the time. In fact, the most important energy that affects us is our own thought and our own feeling. That is why I mentioned the shamanic medicine at the beginning. So, you know, I, I just for reference, um, I create this simple word with trying to, uh, what I'm trying to do is mix this concept of the schematria and the matrix, you know, the, the thing behind the, the, the elite code, if you want to see in that way. So I'm going to play a little clip about uh, three minutes, two minutes and a half, that is going to explain a little bit uh, this, this uh, intro better than me because it's in English. So after this, we, we continue. But this is a really, you know, short video to illustrate what, I'm, what my point is. The universe and all matter contained in it is made up of energy. The elite have knowledge which we don't possess regarding physical phenomena such as the significance of ley lines and numerology. Some ancient civilizations also knew things which we do not, such as the knowledge of stargates and the use of certain shapes or performing certain acts or rituals to gain access to a higher state of awareness. This knowledge has been passed down from these ancient civilizations and the elite have kept it hidden to themselves. The elite enjoy certain knowledge that the spiritual realm not only exists and at all times interpenetrates our world, they also know how to manipulate elements of these spiritual dimensions to make things occur at a given place and time according to their wishes. On the more mundane level, they know how, through the manipulation of words, sounds, and symbols, to change people and the flow of events of the world in which we all move. If magic can be defined as the art and science of causing change in our world to occur, conformity with will, then the forces who know with a certainty that the spiritual realm exists as a part of our ordinary sensory reality have also learned how to bend, shape, and manipulate that reality and the people within it to affect change which will benefit them and create realities in their favor. They do this magic through elaborate rituals, predictive programming, and subliminal manipulation through films, media, and music. For millennia, they have known the power of the unconscious and superconscious mind. They use them against you because you allow it. Subliminal sound and graphics have a massive impact on your day-to-day -day life, whether you notice it or not. As we sleepwalk through our daily lives, 
we rarely question what may be happening in the world of manifestation, the spiritual world, where what is to become real begins to form and take shape before it actually appears in our physical reality. This is magic, and they conduct this magic in plain view. Those with wisdom of such things know that nothing happens by accident, nothing happens by chance, and that there is a design and purpose to everything, whether or not our intellect can perceive it, and that all things are interconnected in both space and time, both from the past through the present to the future. It's not simply the ignorance of the spiritual realm, it's the fact that our feeble, rational mind cannot bear to admit that it does not have all the answers or all the knowledge of all things. Until the time comes when we are able to let go of our arrogance and rational ego and learn to become spiritual warriors for truth, we will continue to have control over our minds. Until we admit that the spiritual world is an eternal part of our normal waking reality, we will continue to be blinded to the powers and abilities the elite wield against the sleeping masses. So, like you can read here, you know, the world sings and symbols rule the world. Not words, no law. So, and no money, if you want to see like that, you know. It's the, the important thing is that, that that is why they print symbols in money, for example. So, when you become aware of this kind of, uh, you know, elite code, you're going to start to see the things different. For example, when you start to compare you know, Asian concepts with modern, co with modern concepts. You want to start to see, for example, in the past, uh, the same religious people that rule the world today, they worship Baal. But at that time, Baal has these depictions, you know, like a bull, Baal, with horns. And this kind of image that we perceive as, you know, bad image because has horns. It's not a really bad image. The horns refers, for example, for uh, to the Fino, um, Fibonacci code, things like that. But they trying to get, we get away of that information based on fear. So they create this kind of you know bad image to produce fear in us. So we reject that kind of knowledge. So the modern concept of workshop uh, workshop um, worship Baal is just a ball, you know and they put it to worship their God again and again and again, just with different, uh, you know, uh, artic concepts. So, in fact, they talking about that in the Earth. Uh, we, it, the Earth, because it's a sphere, it has a radio, and we, when you, you, you know, if you know Spanish or Italian radio, if you just divide ra dio, it's like say, like said the god ra which is the sun in the middle you know the the that is why they trying to make us believe that there is uh, like a sun inside the, the the sphere in fact for the people that believe that the hollow earth they believe they, they have the god ra in the middle illuminating you know from the inner core so it's all the time they use the same kind of concept and that is why they you know, do this kind of ritual all the time. It doesn't matter the what you know time in history you look at. Uh, for our modern world, we have this kind of ridiculous you know <laughs> ceremonies where they go and touch the ball and they, you know make this kind of uh, ritual. And you know, people out there look in this and and they believe that they, this is just simply you know protocols and ceremonies without any importance but when you go to the past you're going to see the same kind of behavior in the religious institution because they need to use this concept to rule the world and to you know uh putting us into a symbolic jail that is why for example they draw a sphere with latitude lines and longitude lines it's like being inside the jail simply as that so when you, at least in the occidental part of the world, when you go to the um, who is behind, immediately is going to jump two institutions. And one is the Catholic institution, the religious institution that rules the occidental part of the world, and also the uh, Jewish people or the Jewish, uh, you know, um, masters, not the regular Jewish people. 
And they have both, they, they have really, you know, similarities that at least can make you doubt about, uh, you know, if the, they are really or not behind the scene. But they have, you know, if you want to understand the education that we receive today, read the Scion protocols and the secret monitor, which is the equivalent of the Scion protocols, but for the share suite. And that, you know, we all hear about the uh, Scion protocol, but I don't know how much people hear, hear about the uh, secret monitor. I don't know if anyone of you know, know that uh, or read that book and it's, it's, it's terrible, you know. It's a, it's a strong reading. So you can see all the time where the actual religion is, you know, it's a Egyptian Babylon religion. I, I think no, you, you can really find that very easy. They have, you know, their own, they, they share the same concepts, the same ideas, the same agenda behind what is going on in, in our world today. And when you start transferring all this information to the science, for example, you're gonna see that all the important scientists or character in the histories, they share the same kind of institution or education because they all are or, or Jesuits or Freemasonry, which is like a branch of the Jesuit order. So that is why all the time you see um, these symbols of the square and compass and the hand, you know, inside the jacket. Um, it's, all, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. In fact, in our day, we have in the $1 bill. So um, even they have their own Bible. When they, in the, in, the, in the Masonic Bible, they, and this is my personal opinion, I don't want to offend anybody, but for me, the, you know, the, the, the Bible has so many, you know, keys to understand what is really going on in that kind of book, even all the religious books, there are, you know, really uh, secret books, if you want to see like that. So you must be, have a lot of knowledge to understand what really is for interpretation or, or for being literal, that kind of thing. But the religious um, Catholic church, they, they take all the concept from the Egyptians. So when they create the characters, like Jesus or the apostles, uh, things like that, they, they are uh, depict, depicted the sun worship. Is, uh, if you start, uh, for me, express this in English is a little difficult, but if you do that research, you're gonna find that, um, that kind of comparison. So, for example, for the Masonic guys, they go directly to the original meaning. They, they don't, uh, you know, hide behind behind names or characters. So they, uh, for their um, initiations, they go directly and say, okay, when I talk about this character, I'm talking about Isis or about the sun or about the moon or about this or about that. So this is the kind of thing that for me is important to everyone, you know, open mind at the same like, like you may be open the mind to understand the flat earth because everything is related. And um, uh, we have a phone call here. Maybe some guy of, you know. So um, for example, even in the Kabbalah, which is something that many Jewish people believe that maybe is of their own culture, it's also in the Egyptian culture. It's also in this kind of Babylonian um, ideas and, and, and concept. And of course, in the modern science, you can start have this kind of, you know, uh, secret meaning. For example, we can, I mean, when I was young and I see Albert Einstein, you know, uh, with the tongue out, you know, uh, doing that, that gesture, I, I, I don't understand what he's doing because at that time, who is going to do that? I mean, in the early 20th century, I mean, who is going to, go with the, that kind of expression. He's a, you know, it's a cool scientist. I, I, I don't, I never understand that, but we, he comes from Shewis people uh, and education and when start see that what he did uh, for who work, you immediately gonna see that kind of 
relationship. In fact, for example, Stephen, Stephen Hawking's, uh, you know, Hawk King, the Hawk King. And when you go to, uh, for example, the religion thing, who has a, a Hawk King? The Egyptians, which represent Horus, Horus, the sun god. And in the modern Catholic Church, the hawk was replaced by a dove. But it's the same concept, it's the same thing. So, you know, this kind of name, the, the, there is a lot of um, iconic name. I hope you, I can show you a few more so you can make your connection. But the first thing that I be aware with the modern science is that nobody uh, can really prove that the Earth is, you know, traveling around the sun. Nobody, uh, even in our times, we have that kind of problem. And uh, or better say, you know, the, the, the proof of the experiment are that the Earth is still, that doesn't move, and the sun and the, um, the sun, the moon, the, the stars revolving uh, uh, above us. So all these experiments show that uh, that is the case. The, the, the Earth is, uh, is at rest. So, for example, even when you, it's a little funny because when you go to the uh, Foucault pendulum, even they don't admit that it's trickery. You know, for example, you can see it from the university. Uh, today it's about Foucault's pendulum, which you'll see in local science museums. I'm going to set fire to this. There's still some vibration there, but I would leave it to go, and then suddenly it goes, and then you get it going in a plane. The amplitude of this oscillation changes with time it decreases because of the friction of the air. Either you set it running for a certain length of time and see that it will rotate for a certain angle, and then have a big fanfare and start it again and burn it with another bit of match, or you put a little motor in the top and give it a little jiggle and put energy in the top, which is somehow cheating because you're actually pushing the damn thing, and you have to make sure you push it in a way which is not going to cause, cause a torque. So that's the way it's done in a lot of museums. There's an electromagnet gently pushing this, overcoming the laws of gravity and wind resistance. Otherwise, the pendulum would slow down and stop. So there's some kind of magnet making that thing move? In the ceiling, there's a ceiling up there. The magnet is helping overcome the force of gravity, keeping this pendulum in motion. Otherwise, it would slow down and stop like the smaller moment. So the important thing behind this simply, you know, experiment is that how they are, uh, you know, tricking us. I mean, they, they don't have, you know, they, they don't care. I mean, uh, they do this kind of behavior in every aspect of the science. They just, uh, if they need to lie us, it's no problem for them. You know, they, they make all this kind of, all the time, you know, tiny things to trying to convince you something that they think uh, is true, but this is the way they, they play the game, you know? So even nobody talks about, for example, the alias uh, problem with the pendulum Foucault, Foucault pendulum. With this, only in the days that we have an uh, um, eclipse of the sun, the pendulum stop and doesn't rotate anymore, just make a straight line back and forward. And that kind of things in, in, in the terms of, of science is telling us that there is some kind of field interacting with this kind of energy, movement, you know, um, magnitude, um, waves, uh, you can call whatever you want, but there is something there. And um, I'm gonna play this little clip. We know, of course, uh, there is an ether out there, but- let's There was a belief that there was an invisible web of energy that connects everything in the 1800s. And scientists were very, uh, in a very heated debate, very controversial, as to whether yeah. or not this field exists. There was a very famous experiment that was conducted to determine if the field called the, the ether field actually existed. The very famous Michelson-Morley experiment. In my opinion, it was a good experiment. However, it was poorly interpreted. For over 100 years, 
Our science has been based in a belief that is incorrect. It's incorrect. Now, this is very interesting. 100 years later, 1986, the United States Air Force replicated the Michelson-Morley experiment. They published the results in the very prestigious journal Nature, the scientific journal Nature. They repeated the experiment with good equipment, much better equipment. The bottom line is that the field exists. They found that the field is actually there. This is reported in August 1986, the journal Nature, volume 322. They said, ah, the field is there. Now, why don't we know about this? This should have made the cover of every major magazine and newspaper. This should have been on CNN headline news or Sky News. But this changes everything for the scientists because the textbooks all say the field is not there. Entire careers are based on the field not being there. So the thing is, for example, you know, when you look into the um, Michelson Morley experiment, uh, who uh, look who have the hand behind, you know, inside the jacket, and we all know that kind of symbol. This is Michelson. So in fact, Morley, he never was, you know, really convinced of the first experiment. That is why we have Michelson Morley, and then we had the Michelson Gale, and then we have the uh, well, you know, all that kind of experiment, but. They, they also, you know, use the scientists that they can control because they, they financial this kind of science. In fact, we have news at that time of the Einstein um, um, time that, uh, you know, the relativity uh, theory is more than Shippey Morgan than the Albert Einstein. And the same thing happened, for example, with Galileo, who, who gave the money to Galileo to build the telescope was a church. And that is why all the time we can see this kind of relationship. In, in, even in our modern days, we have this kind of character like George Lamette, who was the, the guy behind the Big Bang Theory and the Hubble Law. So the, the, th the, the things is, uh, are still the same. The, the, the financial you know, institution is the same institution as, uh, as the beginning of time, if you want to see it in that way. So. I'm going to shamble a little forward in my presentation. Sorry, guys, but uh, I don't have much time and I want to try to look uh, at a few things. For example, in our modern science, they all admit that they, they, they is based on things like Kabbalah, for example. I'm a theoretical physicist, and I like to say that I walk in the footsteps of giants like Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr. I'm not a philosopher. However, I am rather dazzled by the fact that many of the basic mysteries that we find in string theory and the theory of everything seem to be mirrored, mirrored in the Zohar and in the Kabbalah. As a scholar, the most amazing thing of all is the degree to which modern astrophysics sounds like a Kabbalistic text. When I first made the correlations between Kabbalah and science, I was stunned. We do know that Isaac Newton had access to certain mystical texts certain texts of the Kabbalah. Well, the Kabbalistic description of creation is coming from a single little point from a speck and of having matter form and time and space form all together at the very beginning. This sounds very much to me like the description of the Big Bang. I couldn't believe that the Kabbalists could derive these truths without really knowing any mathematics or physics. All the things that could destroy string theory, all the things that do destroy every rival theory of string theory, they are all eliminated in precisely 10 and 26 dimensions. These dimensions are magic. Huh? These dimensions are magic. We physicists don't know where these dimensions come from. The Zohar says those things and could have been a lucky guess. I don't know. It's rather amazing. This uncanny reflection of some of the most advanced cosmology that are mirrored in the Zohar and ancient Kabbalistic texts. So they are alchemists. That is like uh, the same thing in uh, antiquity, uh, but this is modern alchemists. They are not, you know, the real scientists that we believe that these guys are. And these guys are, you know, teaching to other uh, 
um, people the same kind of concept. And that is why, you know, when they're when they trying to, this dimension is magic. It's like, say, show me an atom or show me a quark or a graviton. They're magic. They just know there, they just know any particle. Show me a particle of the magnetic field. Show me a particle of time because you tell me that you can bend time and curve time. How can you curve something that doesn't have any geometry? So it's just magic for them. And um, for example, when you go to understand these kind of fields that they're trying to hide and you know mix up with gravita uh, gravitational waves and that kind of things, it's all the you know it's in the ether. And um, when you go, for example, to the universe and Dr. Einstein, you can start looking into the thing. For example, a magnetic field and uh, an electrical field are physical realities. Of course, we all know that. So a gravitational field is as much of a physical reality as an electromagnetic field. So they took that kind of concept that you can prove every day and always is, you're gonna get the same result and trying to convince you that the gravitational field is like electrical field or magnet, you know, magnetic field. But they never show, nobody can show that kind of thing. So for example, when we're trying to understand what produced the movement of the sun and the moon, and we all know that the sun has this path called analima in the sky, like it's a figure, you know, eight number figure. If you're trying to, you know, go away the system and look our system from outside, for me, the analema, and, and that is why I believe that the sun circles us uh, and the Gleason map is a, is a good map. Maybe we need to work on it, but I believe in that kind of model. The figure eight is associated with the infinity symbol. And it has a reason that, because when we look it to the horizon, we see uh, base, you know, we, we are um, under the spell, if you want to see in that way, of the perspective. So this figure eight, that the moon and sun, only those has that shape. They are sisters and brother, you know, son, uh, you know, son and, 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 and daughter of the mother earth. Um, you can clearly see the eighth path in the sky, but in fact, we are, seen, you know, like collapse in the layers of the atmosphere and the perspective and that kind of thing. But if you can go outside and look it from the top, you're going to see this kind of infinity uh, circuit. Because this shape is, for example, when I translate to a 3D software and I show you this, you're going to believe that this is like a figure eight. But when I start to rotate the camera, you're going to see it's a circle. And that figure eight, all, you know, all it's about is that the sun and the moon has different altitude in his, uh, um, in his path. And that produced the seasons and all the things that we know that this celestial body produced in our uh, world. So here you can see the, the shape, you know, this kind of shape that all the time you see that, that magnet, magnet, you know, going up and down and up and down of that circuit. And you, you can explain even eclipses because you share the same path. You share the same shape of the path that the moon and the sun have. And that are the only, uh, you know, um, celestial body that eclipses. So we are still looking for a real proof of gravitational orbiting because with electricity and magnetism, you can prove that. You can make object orbiting around an electrical field, but we never saw that in the lab based on gravitational fields. So that is maybe why they're trying to compare this uh, reality and try to you know, say, look, a gravitational field is like an electrical field. So when you go in terms of you know, the theory of gravity, you can believe whatever you want, but you must be believed that someone figured out the radius of the Earth, uh, you know, uh, the density of the Earth. Someone uh, figured out the, the weight. Who, who is going to measure the weight of the Earth? Nobody can do that. But they only have one, you know, reality, which is the uh, 
acceleration of the of the you know the the, the um, of the gravity they call it like that of course but that is the real number so they make like a reverse engineering through the centuries you know trying to get all the 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 other uh, parameters involved to create the theory of gravity so what i'm trying to say is that anytime you, you know we we know how deep you can go to the earth in our modern times so if you want to believe that the Eratosthenes at that time figured out the radius of the air and things like that, you can believe that. But the only important thing about that is that they need to create the gravitational constant. That is why they need that. And because they, they put this number about the diameter of the Earth uh, in some time in history, in 70th century, they, they can create, they, they know how to get out the volume of a sphere. So, you know, they put some average between all the components that we have in the Earth and they come to the volume of the Earth and they take out that the density based on that kind of things. And because they have the real number that they try to match, which is the 9.8 meter per square second. So when you continue, you know, what is the body center of the Earth, for example? But they need to use perfect sphere because otherwise it's really difficult to get out this result and do this kind of calculation with you know regular bodies or uh, you know how are you gonna measure the supposedly gravitational uh, pulling of the moon of the mercury if you don't even have how much weight what is the body center of the thing so they always go center to center of the sphere because is the only way they can achieve that kind of numbers. Uh, of course, there is all assumption. In fact, I can tell you that the, I'm gonna skip a little bit, but the real thing is, um, it's like a, the real formula for the um, gravity is, you know, is something like, uh, let me go a little bit. It, you know, it's, it's like this, the real, uh, equation for gravity, you know, it's Newton equal to Cavendish, Boger plus Maskelin plus Newton over Eratosthenes. This is the radio of the Earth, and but it's it's it's, it's that, you know. I mean, because I need to skip a, a, a few slides, but here you have Eratosthenes, here you have Boger and Maskelin and Cavendish, and then you have Newton. So they need all those centuries to try and figure out how to match that 9.8 meters square per second. I had all the calculation and I can keep talking, but uh, I have a really short time and I'm not going to finish my presentation one more time. <laughs> so sorry, guys. Um, uh, but for example, in terms of the distance to the sun, uh, this is the guy who proposed the distance of the sun. It's another Jesuit called Maximilian Hell. And uh, you know, this is all the Time, they, they, they trying to match, you know, the things uh, to match reality and the, you know, the numbers that they need to plot the heliocentric model. Uh, this is the Maximilian Hill. Uh, here you can read of the, the publication of his result was delayed and some, especially, accused Hill uh, posthumously of falsifying his result again, you know. And this is official history. And this guy presented the distance to the sun. So if the distance of the sun is incorrect, the astronomical unit is incorrect. So all the measurements on the space is, are, are, are incorrect. That is the importance of that measurement, of that distance. So is there so much to show us, to show you? But I'm starting to put in a little sad, but uh, you know, based on, for example, let me just, for four more minutes, I promise I, I, I tell it up, but, you know, talking about the sun, for example, we, you know, in the electrical universe, uh, I, I believe it has more, you know, a nice model to present us than the heliocentric model. And let's, let's uh, hear uh, Don Scott talking about that. Good afternoon. My name is Don Scott. Uh, the electric sun is a is a sort of a natural outgrowth 
of the electrical universe hypothesis. We know that their magnetic fields uh, actually had a circuit that showed the electric sun. What I'd like to do today is to show some of the problems of the so-called standard model. That word model should be plural, models, because for every thing that we see in the sun, there seems to be a new model, or at least another patch on the previous existing model. Problems that I feel, at least, are fatal, absolutely fatal, for the models that are so-called accepted these days. And I would like to then demonstrate how precisely those problems are no problem at all for the electrical sun model. The big problem, the famous problem, is the missing neutrinos. Uh, the idea of this heat transport from the core to the surface. Uh, there are some oscillations in the sun's size and brightness. And of course, oscillations in the solar wind, as somebody pointed out the other day. Uh, if, if there's a fusion reaction going on in the core, then how can this, does this reaction, does it have periodicities? That's never been, never, never been discussed when, in, by nuclear physicists. The, there is actually a temperature minimum in the chromosphere. Where in the world does that come from? If, if the heat is all generated at the core, the temperature should get lower and lower and lower the further away you get from this thing. All of a sudden you find there's a minimum and then the temperature increases. Totally inexplicable uh, in light of the present standard so-called model or models. The, the, the sun actually oscillates in, in brightness from a few, few minutes to near an hour. So the thing is pulsing very rapidly. There's no way in this world, in this solar system, that that could happen. Uh, and the third one is, to me, astounding if you haven't heard about it. That is, the, there's an expansion and contraction of the sun in the size of the sun. The thing actually bulges and fluctuates in size like a balloon. <laughs> And the, the, the extent of that bulging is 10 kilometers. So, for example, 10 kilometers, the extension. So what is the size for the standard model of the sun? You're going to detect 10 kilometers? <laughs> you know, but this guy is talking more seriously. And, and when you remember, for example, the FA core presentation about the model of the sun in the computer model, you can really see how this thing breathes and, you know, generate dynamics, vortices magnetism that move the, you know, the water currents and, you know, give us life in every way of, or shape or form. So, and that happens in about a period of about 160 minutes. Where did that come from? And how do you explain it from the so-called standard model? They just ignore it. So, you know, these kind of things, we must be start to get into consideration because we believe, you know, like uh, in, in, in life, we, we used to think, because they proposed that, that we need to think, you know, like uh, to be with, to one point to the other is a straight line, but in nature, it's never a straight line. Nature use spirals, you know, vortices. That is the way that the nature really behave. And when you start looking, you know, in things like electricity and that kind of thing, you, we, we have the model just simply on that. I mean, you don't need gravity models because with electricity and magnetism, you can produce, you know, attraction, repulsion, you know, buoyancy, um, um, levitation. Uh, it, it doesn't matter the material. It doesn't matter if it's pl plastic or good or water or iron or metals. It's all the same. You, you, you have it there, you know, in our own face. In fact, when you, you know, plug a magnet directly to water, you're going to have this repulsion. So the sun, when circled around the Earth, produces a lot of dynamics to our, plan, uh, to our plane. You know, we don't need, in fact, I, I don't have the time to show, you, to show us, but um, to show you that the Mac, the scientific Mac, the, the guy behind the speed of the sound, he talks about if you have a firmament moving and we have a field like the ether, uh, that produce all the dynamics that we need to explain our, you know, life uh, uh, model of the Earth and all the, you know, weather, currents. Uh, look, at, for example, this here. You get close a magnet, you're going to move the water. In fact, it's not just that. I, 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 don't, I don't know if I have in this video. I didn't. But uh, 
he, he, there is a guy very famous on the internet that put a magnet uh, near to a, a mice and also push it. So the orientation that the supposedly gravity produce is just, it's just an electrical orientation. It's like talking about electric gravity. And uh, that is why the thing's falling down or goes up. You don't need uh, the gravity force to explain that orientation. And uh, well, I have a few things more to, to cover. You know, here you can see the comparison between electrical fields and the sun corona, you know, ejection. For me, it's more electrical than fire. You can, you can clearly see in this kind of comparison. We have the moon formation, the, you know, even, even our, you know, uh, with this, I, 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 I close in the, the, the presentation, but for example, even a uh, surface feature in our own plane of existence is formed by electricity. You know, if you go to the Thunderbolt project, you can clearly see that uh, in really profound detail, uh, how you can form, um, you know, um, surface detail in our plane of existence. You can clearly see how you can create dunes, dunes mountains, uh, you know, valleys, craters on the moon. There is a lot of craters. Uh, there is one or two models of the crater that we see on the moon that the, the, the normal science can explain because it's not formed by an impact. Uh, you can have rivers based on electricity. I mean, the path of the real flow every little aspect that we see in our you know real life model you can replicate based on electricity and remember the greek uh concept of zeus zeus create the world with a thunder so maybe our plane of existence was created you know by electricity at least you can replicate these models and with the standard model you cannot replicate and i'm going to finish with this simple video please allow me to to share this because um you're going to see here a replication of our sun of our you know energy models and all the time they need to clarify that is there is no base in gravity models it's based on ether models we are so excited to be here today. Uh, so the first time I met Paul, so this was many years ago, I walked in and he said, Karen, I created this sun in a jar. I got this star in a jar. I'm like, you're kidding me. He's like, oh yeah, all that stuff you've learned, put it all in the back of your brain because I'm going to show you something awesome. But this is just to show off. This is to show off Paul and some of the really neat ways that elements work and that, uh, that chemistry works. And so, so what this really is, is a oversimplification of what dragon really is it's it's combining a, uh, a yin and yang energy frequency together and they both attract they they want what each other each other has there's value in that exchange so contrary to what um they teach in science contrary to what um they teach in science um the universe is actually magnetic and light um the universe is actually magnetic and light um, it's not gravitational driven. It's, um, it's not gravitational driven. It's so what this is, is I'm going to um, induce an electrical and magnetic field. This, this outer ball is the male or um, yang field. And this silver one inside is the yin or female field. The tabernacle so just like the sun, males and females like to do, they are going to go at it. So with no further ado, I'm going to now put this over. In order to help, so instead of a sun actually being a um, uh, a fusion generator eating its own hydrogen and helium, and over time, you know, it's going to use all of its um, fuel. It's actually being the sun is actually being powered by something else. There's something else. It's powering by something else. <laughs> what what is going on with the sun? And we're going to see that in a few seconds. So it's acting on that female field, if you will, that's creating that sun. There's no fusion in the sun. They don't know how the sun works. Eric Dollar. What's it? Transform. Transforms from some other dimension. It's not burning anything. It doesn't have to. It's a converter. I don't know. Nobody knows. 
but that's what it does. That's the only thing it can do because that's how everything works. So the sun is not visible. Right? Not in free space. It's only invisible when gross matter becomes involved, like the Earth's atmosphere and envelope and the surface of the moon or whatever. That makes the light. So that means there's no time delay. So the whole time delay thing is, is meaningless. It doesn't take light years. There are no light years because there's no light. So that, that means that the light you see from the distant stars isn't four million years old. It could be only minutes old. It could be instantaneous. All the theories collapse when you can't see the stars in outer space. And that is what happened. You know, any 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 try you know any time that we you know hear about no because that star or that star is so far away or that star. You know, rise up a balloon and show me the start above 30 kilometers and make that comparisons. Because all the time we see the star from the ground and the only thing that the star could be inside or in the firmament is because it's projected in the layers of the atmosphere. It's in those layers of the firmament, I mean. But when you go outside those layers, there is no more stars. So you cannot assume nothing measure in, in terms of measurement and they call light ears because it's the luciferian ears you know all the time they they use this kind of concept so that is why lucifer rules the space and they don't need to prove nothing about that in fact look at this picture this guy that talked in, in in the beginning of the video what he have in the background of his love egyptian knowledge because the ships and I don't believe that they are bad guys, you know, it's just the Sheswit took their knowledge and they use for their own purpose and they don't share with us because they don't want to, we have access to free energy and more important to the spiritual, uh, you know, teachings. Because after all, we want to go to the same box, you know, after this game. It doesn't matter if you are Sheswit or Shoes or, you know, Musman, whatever. Uh, we need to learn how to move in that <laughs> in that plane because that is where we come from and where we're going and these guys are kept you know that in secret so when you start to put all the piece together and believe me i can keep talking a little more but i don't have much time and i don't want to respect the other speaker time but for me i really recommend that take a time to understand the electrical universe and the schematria and the symbolism because it's all tied together and you're gonna maybe uh, get the, the the knowledge to go back to the source and you know prepare to transcend spiritually and with the consciousness. So thank you for for listening, me. and thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Uh -huh.